Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and uh, happy World Soils Day, first of all. <clears throat> uh, welcome to this webinar. I'm Bruce Sells, President of the British Society of Soil Science, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our second webinar of the year. Um, just before I welcome our panellists, I'd like to introduce the, the British Society of Soil Science as hosts of today's webinar. We're an established membership um, and international membership organisation and charity committed to the study of soil in its widest aspects. We bring together those working within academia and have a growing membership amongst practitioners implementing soil science in industry and those with a keen interest in soils. This is uh, the last uh, Zoom into Soil webinar of the year and we're really, really pleased to be able to host it on World Soil Day. And World Soil Day 2022 and its campaign Soils Where Food Begins aims to raise awareness of the importance of maintaining healthy ecosystems and human well-being by addressing the growing challenge um, in soil management, increasing soil awareness and encouraging societies to improve soil health. Um, looking forward to, to next year, we'll be hosting eight webinars, um, so please do keep an eye out on our website for further details. So just before we begin, some basic house housekeeping. As there are so many of you uh, here today, all your microphones have been muted. We'll be taking questions at the end of both presentations uh, and my colleague uh, Katie will monitor these for us. So if you do have a question, please just type it in as you go. And if we can get all questions submitted by 12.50, that will allow um, Katie to review them and to get through as many as we can in the time we've got. Um, although there is a, a raise your hand button, we won't be using this unless the presenter specific asks for a show of hands. And uh, today's presentation has also been awarded BASIS and NROSO CPD points. So if you're registered with either body, please contact us, direct, contact us directly after the event. And also then just finally, please be aware that we are recording today's presentation. So to, to move on to, um, to our presentations, um, I would now like to introduce uh, Chris Cantle. Chris is a Chartered Principal Soil and Geo-Environmental Scientist at Jacobs. He joined Jacobs after completing an MSc in soil science at the University of Aberdeen in 2015. Chris primarily works on large infrastructure projects in the fields of land contamination, environmental impact assessment, soil resource management and ecological mitigation. Uh, and uh, I'll hand over to you, Chris. OK, well, thanks, Bruce. And uh, hi, everyone. Happy World Soil Day. I'm going to be talking today about the Colm Valley Western Slopes and how we've used soil science to help maximise habitat creation within the ISP2 project. So to give a bit of background on the project, High Speed 2 is a new high speed railway link between London and major cities in the Midlands and North of England. The line is the joint venture delivering the central one portion of HS2 Phase 1, so showing around here. And the C1, in, C1 includes a 16 kilometre twin bore tunnel through the Chiltern Hills and a three and a half kilometre viaduct over the Colne Valley. The Colne Valley Western Slopes, which is the, the subject of our presentation, is located between the north embankment of the viaduct and the southern portal of the Chosen Tunnel. Jacobs has been providing multidisciplinary design and construction support to the line for around five years now. The site, when we inherited it uh, prior to construction, it was a large area of arable farmland, including a sand and gravel extraction site visible in this image. It was permitted as an authorised landfill at the time. The site lies over a principal chalk aquifer and there are several public water obstructions nearby, so it is a sensitive water environment. Groundwater depths are variable, ranging from around one and a half metres in the southeast of the site to 32 metres below ground level in the northwest of the site, as shown by here. Uh, HS2 undertook soil surveys prior to construction commencing, and we use the data to derive agricultural land classification mapping. The site was classified as ALC subgrade 3A to grade 2, so good quality to very good quality. And you can see the mapping for the northern half of the site here. Soils were grouped into handling unit units to indicate their resilience to structural damage. And we classify the soils as having medium resilience to damage overall. Soil textures and stoniness were also mapped to provide additional information on soil handling and segregation. I'll now move on to our design vision for the site. So our vision has been guided by the site's wider context within the Chilterns. We're aiming to replicate a chalk download mosaic as illustrated here. 
These images show the types of habitat we are looking to create and two species of fauna typically associated with these. This is our landscape master plan for the site. So the Con Valley Western Slopes represents by a significant margin the largest single opportunity for habitat creation and enhancement and net biodiversity gain within the C1 section. And it's one of the largest areas with potential for habitat creation on the phase one route. The original design included agricultural restoration west of the railway tracks, with agreed for habitat creation to be extended to this area. We are looking to create 127 hectares of wildflower and invertebrate rich calcareous grassland and wood pasture and wetland habitat. This will constitute the largest area of calcareous grassland in the Chilterns, which is our key target habitat. It will also be the largest, largest single contributor to net biodiversity gain on the HS2 route, with a potential 13% net gain within the C1 contract area. Mitigation and integration of the railway are equally key drivers, which is partly why we grade out from a largely closed woodland canopy around the railway through to open habitats across the wider site. This image shows an impression of what we're aiming for, including the chalk down the mosaic alongside the south portal for the Chilton tunnels. There was early recognition within the design team that soil was a key to delivering the target habitats, particularly calcareous grassland. And this soil profile from Aston Row and Triple SI in the Chilterns is typical of the habitat type. This photo was taken during early evaluation of several exemplar calcareous grasslands in the Chilterns. Generally, calcareous grasslands form on steep south facing slopes over free draining, alkaline soils, directly over chalk, with no nutri low nutrient levels. These factors exert stress in the vegetation communities, favouring niche calcicles and preventing common grass species from dominating the sward. These stresses, along with suitable management, also inhibit ecological succession, leading to biodiverse habitat habitats in the long term. These habitats can take hundreds of years to develop, so they're not easily replicable, but we're trying to kickstart the process here. Moving on to the construction phase, this is how the site currently looks. It's the main construction hub for C1, so it's a highway of activity. One of the key aspects, aspects for us to consider has been the reuse of around two and a half million metres cubed of chalk horizons from the twin boring of the Chilton Tunnel. And this is what we call chalk cave once it's being processed. And I'll come back to this. Somewhere in the region of 700,000 metres cubed of soils are being stripped, stored and reinstated on the site alone and maintaining a soil balance across the C1, C1 area is crucial. We followed HS2's technical standards and specifications in developing an overarching soil resource plan for the C1 area, as well as site-specific plans for each discrete area. And we undertake regular inspections to audit against the standards and methodologies within these. So this image you can see in the northeast of the site, that's where the, the compounds and, and site offices are located, as well as uh, Precast batteries for the viaduct segments and the tunnel segments. In the west of the site and around, generally around the, the construction compound, there's various soil stockpiles. In the southwest of the site, there's you might be able to pick out a long narrow strip along the uh, the, the southern you know side of the site, and that is a trials area, which again I'll come back to. Um, and in the east of the site, east of the railway trace, which you can see uh, on the image, that's where the majority of chalk cake has been placed to date. So I'm now going to show a video which <clears throat> illustrates nicely what I've just been speaking about. You might not to hear the audio, but that, that shouldn't matter. In a second. So hopefully this gives a better idea of the, the scale of the site and the, the process in achieving the design vision. So you can see the tunnel segments there going into the tunnel and this is uh, part of the process where it's being constructed. Here is where the chalk cake uh, is taken out following treatment within the soil, sorry, treatment plant and then it's taken hauled around site to its plate deposition area. So you can see it being placed out in the landscaping here, the chalk cake. This is showing a kind of um, yeah, time lapse of, of that chalk cake being placed in the southeast of the site. And as mentioning at the end of the construction, um, this is what we're looking to create once everything's been decommissioned.
So one of the one of the key aims is for it, the site to be public, publicly accessible in the long term. So uh, there will be uh, a lot of footpaths for the public to access the site and um, enjoy it for recreational use. And that's that. Right, I'm now going to talk briefly about our approach to sustainable remediation of materials reuse, which is important in the subsequent landscaping. When we inherited the site, there were several historical landfills and infill pits at the site, with asbestos and lead being the main contaminants of concern. Following risk assessment, including contaminant based in transport modelling, we identified some risks which required remediation. Our options appraisal identified that the cover system was the most sustainable and appropriate solution, taking into account environmental, social, and economic factors. Since we already planned to place chalk cake across most of these areas, this only required relatively minor amendments to design to ensure a suitable depth of cover was in place for each source area. As mentioned before, um, replacing a large volume of chalk cake and retaining this material on site was a key objective. You can see here the rough extent of chalk cake placement over the southern quadrants and around the south portal hood, with the northern quadrants degraded using mainly existing subsoils and superficial deposits. Due to the use of additives to render the material suitable for placement and trafficking, we needed to demonstrate suitability for use through risk assessment. This image shows how we zoned the site for controlled waters risk assessment. We undertook a detailed testing regime for laboratory simulated chalk cake in advance of construction and groundwater modelling to show that the material does not pose any unacceptable risks. And this is being verified through a combination of ongoing leachate testing with the actual tunnel rising and several lysimeters installed within the trial plots. So you can see here uh, a rig that was used to install lysimeters um, and an image showing a, a typical cross section of what a, uh, this, these lysimeters were installed look like within the soil profile. We're also reusing chalk sustainably on site to create water bodies of high ecological value, which I'll come into in more detail. We've derived criteria to allow the reuse of recycled aggregates under certain conditions and are aiming to sustainably reuse temporary works aggregates, mainly crushed concrete and limestone aggregate to improve soil profile conditions within the landscaping. All of our site one materials are being managed under the definition of waste development industry code of practice via a series of materials management plans and this is all um, tracked during construction. I'll now move on to the soil science challenges we face and the solutions we have identified. Published soil mapping suggests the presence of Coombe 1 and Batcom soil associations on site which largely are caused with the survey data. The soils, uh, the Coombe soil series is a typical brown calcareous earth and got a profile, a typical profile image of this here. The soils on site are predominantly silty clay loams, which are naturally well drained. Laboratory analyses show that the topsoils are nutrient rich, as would be expected in agriculturally improved soils. However, the upper subsoils are largely suitable for the main target habitat of calcareous grass and being alkaline and slightly calcareous with fairly low phosphate levels, although there is a degree of variability in this. Nitrogen is low, which could result in slow rates of establishment. Um, and topsoils will generally benefit from low rates of compost addition in tree planting pits particularly. These graphics show the variability in upper subsoil phosphate levels, which could be a limitation for the diversity of the calcareous grass and sward. This is being considered further within the soil profile trials, which we'll come back, back to. Available phosphate in milligrams per litre is shown on the map, along with the DEFRA index, which denotes ranges of these levels. The green and dark green points represent the level of phosphorus phosphate we would like to see for calcareous grassland. There's no clear basis for segregation from this uh, and stockpile storage space is also limited. The two main substrates over which we'll be landscaping will be site lower subsoil, which we've covered in brief already, and the chalk cake and uh, tunnel risings. This material represents a unique challenge for the landscaping. The nitro chalk material will be completely destructured during tunneling and subsequent processing. The hydraulic conductivity is expected to be very low post placement in the region of 1 times 10 to the negative 9 meters per second, so it's likely to constitute a solely permeable layer. These conditions are unlikely to be suitable for the majority of niche calcicles, which are adapted to free draining soils. 
Based on the site soils and substrates available, soil profiles have been designed for each habitat, balancing a site mass hall. The profile is centred around the gradation of soil horizon depths to promote succession within woodland areas and inhibit succession within the calcareous grass. These depth gradations can be seen here across the, the grassland and woodland habitats. However, there are still challenges associated with delivering these habitats over the slowly permeable chalkcake and soils that will have had large scale construction activities over them for more than five years. We're also looking to beneficially reuse construction materials, limestone aggregates, and crushed concrete within the soils to improve their suitability for the habitats, including the aggregate layer, which is shown here um, beneath the upper subsoil and calcareous grassland. Uh, the idea being this will help create soil suitable soil moisture conditions and provide a long term reservoir of calcium carbonate to sustain a bio biodiverse calcareous grass and sward through continued weathering. Drainage trenches are also being considered as a means of improving the soil hydrology, um, but this is all subject to the trials. So, in, in general, you can see we're grading from uh, around 200 mm of subsoil over our uh, lower subsoil of chalk cake with potentially a 100 mil calcareous aggregate layer um, in between. And then through to the woodland areas where we're going for much deeper topsoil depths um, over lower subsoil or upper subsoil, um, depending on availability um, over the substrate. So um, yeah, we're, we're, that, that these should hopefully promote succession within the woodland areas. The calcareous grass and trials then, so as a result of uncertainties in the soil profiles, we're undertaking a series of trials to optimise the designs and reduce landscaping risks. The, the main challenge is the nutrient enrichment of agricultural soils and drainage of chalk tunnel arisings from TBMs. The trials are helping to determine this optimal soil profile for the calcareous grassland, including the use, depth and grading of the calcareous aggregate layer the need for and spacing of drainage trenches and any amelioration required. A series of laboratory and field trials have been undertaken in tandem at Granfield University's innovative glasshouse facilities under controlled conditions and at the same time at the Conway Western Slopes within a dedicated trials area which you can see part of here where we've got the um, calcareous grass and plots. We're drawing our multidisciplinary team here including earthworks specialists Geotechnical engineers, ecologists, and soil specialists across Jacobs, Cranfield University, Timmer Hare Associates, and the Align JV. The trials will have wider application to the industry and will contribute to HS2's learning legacy. Chris McCloskey is going to discuss these trials more in the, in the next presentation. In addition to the calcareous grassland trials, we're also undertaking wetland and planting trials across the rest of the trials area visible here. The wetland trials are evaluating the use of chalk cake as a substrate for water bodies as an alternative to puddle clay. This will help establish biodiverse wetland habitats using site or materials. Uh, the trials are in an early stage, but initial results indicate the low permeability substrate can be achieved with the chalk cake with similar performance to puddle clay. You might see from this graph here that uh, the results are variable with the chalk cake, and this is mainly due to refinement of the construction method, uh, along with some fissuring of the substrate materials during the drought this summer. So we, we do have um, one water body where chalk cake is working particularly well, um, and the clay has worked particularly well as well, um, very similar levels. And you can see the stage board here with water level exceeding one metre. The planting trials are also at an early stage with seeding undertaken, but planting yet to be completed. The intention is to optimise the use of seed, mulch and herbicides, thereby reducing cost of material imports. And you can see the one of the wetland trial bodies here alongside planting trials either side on the slopes. Climate resilience, uh, climate change resilience and carbon. So the habitats and plant species selected should be resilient to climate change impacts. The creation of natural habitats in place of arable land will increase carbon sequestration with an additional 54,000 tonnes of CO2 equivalent sequestered over a 40 year period. And it is estimated to be about 7% uh, of the line's carbon impact. The carbon footprint will also be reduced by sustainable reuse of materials, including minimising off-site exports and avoiding the need for material imports to support landscaping. The remediation approach using cover system has also reduced the carbon footprint by retaining material in situ. So I just wanted to end the presentation with an image of how the site looked uh, at the start of construction and our design vision for the site in the long term. Thank you for listening.
Brilliant. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chris. That was really interesting. Um, so as I said at the start, we'll be taking questions uh, for both speakers at the end of the session. Um, but I'd like to move on to our, our second speaker, who is uh, Chris McCloskey. Chris is a postdoctoral research fellow in soil restoration and habitat recreation at Cranfield University, exploring how we can use construction derived materials to create soil profiles that can support the creation of biodiverse calcareous grassland. Um, Chris completed his PhD in 2021, in which he explored plant driven turnover of soil organic matter and developed improved stable isotope methods to separate plant and soil carbon fluxes. He is more broadly interested in plant soil interactions and how these can control soil processes and functions. Uh, and Chris is also a member of the, the Society's Early Careers Committee. So over to you, Chris. Thanks, Bruce. Um, can I just confirm you can see the presentation? Yeah, we can see that, Chris. Thank you. Ah, fantastic, thanks. And uh, thanks, Chris, also for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the work we've been doing at Cranfield and then the, the related trials on the South Portal site, looking at how we can optimise soil profiles to support calcareous grassland habitat creation. So during this talk, I'm going to first give a brief overview of the um, the overall project uh, and then look at four of the key trial phases, the pilot trials and the similar trials at Cranfield and the field concept trials and field trials at the South Portal site. So as Chris has already um, very, very clearly explained, there's going to be a uh, very large area of Talcaris grassland created at the Cone Valley Western Slopes by the Align and HS2 joint venture as part of the phase one um, section of the HS2 construction. And to really understand how we can best create calcareous grasslands, which are a biodiverse and highly valuable, but um, very sort of specialised habitat, there's a series of soil profile trials to work out how we can refine the um, habitat creation methods. The first stage of this was materials testing at uh, Cranfield um, and elsewhere last year. And then this year I've undertaken the pilot trials in Cranfield's uh, controlled environment facilities that you can see on the right here. And in the new year, we're going to be moving on to the larger scale of our similar trials. In tandem with this and feeding back and forth within each other are the field trial components. The field concept trials also ran earlier this year, and I'll be showing some results from those as well. And the field trials are um, just, just getting underway. They've just been seeded and they'll be running for two years, followed by the uh, wider landscape and habitat creation and a period of monitoring. So a key part of this project is that we're trying to have innovative use of the site one materials, that is materials which would otherwise be byproducts from the development and might end up as waste. And we're trying to use these to create these specialised um, soil profiles to support biodiverse calcareous grassland. There's four key materials that we're looking at here. The first two are upper and lower subsoils. And these are mainly silty clay loams with a quite high pH, the ones we've worked with are around pH 8.5. These soils have a highly variable calcium carbonate content and we've observed the soils that we've been working with at Cranfield from the site, varying from roughly half a percent to at least 80% calcium carbonate. And um, the, this variation is another aspect that we really want to try to capture in our analysis of the soil profiles. Next, we have calcareous aggregates. Now, this is going to be sourced from decommissioned site compounds and hall roads and will take the form of crushed limestone aggregates and crushed concrete. This is calcareous material, which is um, likely to be very useful for creating drainage in the soil profiles, and that's a key aspect that we're going to be testing. Finally, there's the chalk tape that Chris mentioned. Um, this is a very high pH, 8.5 to 12.5, highly calcareous material. As you can see at the bottom here, when it's dry, it's a very crumbly, um, dusty material. But when it's wet, it becomes quite impermeable and very putty-like. And one of the real challenges here is to work out how we can best incorporate this into the trial profile level uh, layers and what our, our best option for using it will be. So um, we've got four soil profiles we're looking to test. These all have an initial top layer down to 20 centimetres of upper subsoil. Below this, there's either going to be a layer of chalk cake 
or lower subsoil. And we want to test these profiles with and without that calcareous aggregate in a 10 centimetre layer to try to improve drainage and overcome the drainage limitations that we might have with the chalk cake. The first stage of the Cranfield were the pilot trials. Um, so these were constructed in the first few months of this year. We looked at the four profiles um, and across these, we also had three upper subsoil calcium carbonate levels, not 10% of the low treatment, a median treatment of 10 to 20% and a high treatment of um, 20 to 50%. Now, these were packed into soil columns, which were 80 centimetres tall with a diameter of 25 centimetres. And we had 60 columns in total. Um, so that was gave us three replicates per soil profile times calcium carbonate level treatment. These are seeds with a commercially available uh, grassland and seeds mix, a combination of forbs and grasses, which are suitable for growth in calcareous habitats. We're pleased to say that it's successfully established in all of the um, profiles and all the calcium carbonate levels, with a total of 27 species present across the trial. We have a total of 31 species present in the seed mix. And so that's a fairly reasonable, uh, fairly good, in fact, um, germination rate, given that many of these species require somewhat specialised and cooler temperatures to germinate. And the trial of seed is in mid-May this year. So obviously that was just before quite a hot period, um, particularly in the glass house. There's an average of 12 species present in each column. And while an, a mature calcareous grassland can develop a much higher species density, that's not necessarily a bad starting level for what's going to be a very early calcareous grassland which will need to develop over many years. So over the course of the three month trial, the uh, vegetation grew very vigorously. Here we can see images of a single column over uh, three one month intervals. And as you can see, the canopy came largely closed over that period and that was the case in the vast majority of the mesoplasms. There were quite a few things we wanted to measure in the trial. Firstly in terms of soil chemistry we wanted to look at available P and N, particularly P given that nutrient limitation is very important to the success of the calcareous grassland creation project. We also wanted to look at soil organic matter and organic C, in part to see whether there were initial changes in these after grassland uh, establishment and seeding. We also wanted to look at pH and calcium carbonate content to look at whether the initial uh, setup was likely to be a conducive to successful grassland establishment and whether that might change over the course of the trial. We wanted to look at soil biology, such as microbial biomass and soil respiration, to assess whether there was an active biological uh, soil uh, microbial community to provide nutrients to plants. And we also wanted to look at key facts in soil physics and hydrology, such as soil moisture content and infiltration rates. These are particularly important as calcareous grasslands depend on moderately to freely draining soils. And finally, a key metric was, of course, the vegetation performance, such as the initial rate of emergence, monthly measures of species diversity, maximum height, and then final above ground biomass. So looking at the soil chemistry first, we found low levels of soil damp matter, nitrogen, and available P. P limitation is very important to calcareous garden success. Um, forest research gives an upper limit of 25 milligrams per litre for successful establishment of the calcareous grassland, but states the ideal value is lower than 10 milligrams per litre. Um, this is really key as high phosphorus levels in particular will allow more vigorous species um, to outcompete the calcareous grassland specialists and you'll end up with just a few very competitive dominant species and not the biodiverse spoils we want to achieve here. We're glad to say that of the soils we looked at here, um, which were, I should say, randomly sampled um, from the uh, stockpiles, so we weren't aiming for a particular level of nutrient content, um, these were mostly within the um, acceptable upper limits for calcareous grass in terms of extractable P. And one of the treatments, one of the soils, the one low in calcium carbonate, did fall below the lower threshold, which is good to see. Um, so it may be that we have something of a mosaic habitat here with some areas more biodiverse and others hosting other species, which certainly wouldn't be a bad thing. But we also do see that the 
overall levels of P in the medium and high capital type of subsoils declined over the course of three month trials. It will be very interesting to see if this decline continues and if they also reach that ideal threshold over longer term trials as more P is taken up by plants and in the longer term particularly potentially taken off site due to, for example, grazing and mowing or harvesting of the grass. <coughs> so in terms of nitrogen, there's a lower threshold expected to be required for um, healthy, at least rapid health establishments of calcareous grassland, around 0.15 or 0.2%, with an ideal range higher than that. All the soils we looked at here fell below that range um, and declined over the course of the trial. It's unclear whether this will be a problem in the longer term, though. Quite a few of the species we have present are legumes who, in partnership with uh, rhizomic bacteria, would be expected to fix nitrogen. This doesn't appear to have a substantial effect over the three month trials. It's possible that the trials were simply not long enough to have a major effect in these soils. It's also possible that these soils used, which have been stockpiled and allowed at least to partially dry for a period of months or years, may have um, slightly depauperate microbial populations and there may have been a lack of rhizobium to colonise the roots of the legumes. This is something that we intend to look at in more detail in the lysimeter trials and we'll be able to see the longer term impact of this over two years in the field trials. Looking at the soil biology, there was initially low microbial biomass but this increased during the trial. It remains significantly lower in the low calcium carbonate treatment. This may be because, as we've seen, that one is the lowest in soil organic matter and phosphorus, so there may just be a lack of substrates and nutrients for microbial growth. We saw no increase in microbial restoration over the course of the trial, but we did see a loss in soil organic matter. Now, we wonder if that might be due to initial um, increased access by soil microbes to previously protected soil organic matter which would have been exposed to microbial attack during disturbance such as during the packing of the columns. If so this may not represent a long-term trajectory and it may be that that um, was quite rapid at the start of the trial but in the longer term as Chris mentioned would be expected we'll see an increase in soil carbon. This is something we intend to look at both in the long term over two years in the field trial but also with a higher temporal resolution with monthly measurements of microbial respiration and soil organic matter in the lysimeter trials. Looking at the soil hydrology, we as expected saw um, higher, higher moisture levels in the chalk cake layers. Given we've seen that these are very slow to drain and uh, do seem to retain moisture quite, quite well. We didn't see any differences between the moisture content at the end of the trial in the upper subsoil. However, this trial was, take, uh, was conducted in a glass house during quite a warm weather period this year and it may well be that during this period evaporation from the top of the surface was, was have been quite high and therefore the effect of down profile drainage may not be so important. We'll be very interested to observe in the field trials um, whether there are substantial differences between upper subsoil wetness during the winter when the condition was to be much colder and wetter. We did however see that the soil moisture content of the calcareous aggregate layer was much lower. Now we weren't able to test the lateral flow through this layer subsurface that we would be expecting as hoping for in the field. We did however, um, well th these results do however suggest that this layer is freely draining and may well provide these um, these desired properties and we'll be investigating it further in the field. Finally, vegetation performance. Obviously, this is a key metric, and we did see that this was greater in the profiles of lower subsoils. In all the profiles, we saw that the plants were able to root right down to the bottom, even through the fairly thick and impermeable chalk cake and through the, um, the calcareous aggregate layers. We speculate that the, uh, the plants may therefore, in the profile with lower subsoils be able to get more nutrients from those lower subsoils in comparison to the chalk cake layers. This isn't necessarily a problem for the chalk cake treatments though, as Alfred was mentioned, nutrient constraints are quite important in calcareous grasslands for species diversity. It's unclear at the moment whether there may be a lack of nutrients, particularly nitrogen, in the profile with chalk cake in particular. 
this is something that we'll be looking at very closely and with great interest during the field trials. So next at Fanfield's now controlled environment facilities, we're going to use what we've learned from the, pro the, uh, the um, pilot trials to move on to the lysimeter trials. These are going to be larger to scale and longer term studies with one metre cubed soil mesotosms, then to run over six months with monthly measurements. These are therefore going to be a controlled and higher resolution, tightly monitored complement to the field trials, allowing us to observe particular processes in a controlled environment and much more closely than we would in the field. We're going to look at the same things as in the uh, pilot trials, but as regular root and vegetation scans to monitor above and below ground plant growth, as well as X-ray CT scans to assess soil structure, um, both how it might be affected by pro profile configurations and also how it might change during the first six months of grafting establishments. The other trials which have been undertaken this year were the first stage of the field trials, the field concept trials. Now these had a slightly different purpose. They were designed to look at the importance of firstly subsoiling to decompact the upper layer of either the upper subsoil or the chalk cake, and secondly cultivation depth, whether it's important to cultivate to depth to um, mix in to an extent to key in the upper subsoil layer, that's class 5 US here, with the lower layers. And these lower layers are on the right, class um, 5LS, that is lower subsoil, and the class 4 treatments, um, 4A and 4B, are untreated and treated chalk cake. The layers you see in the middle of these, with class 5E, are again used in the calcareous aggregate, and these are drainage trenches to see if to investigate whether it's important to have these present to have la increased and enhanced lateral down slope drainage. Um, the, uh, the calcareous aggregate layers here were not tested as they would have um, caused a problem for the deeper chisel ploughing um, keying in operation. So as you can see here, these were quite large scale trials with large bays excavated to the correct uh, depth about 80 centimetres and then the chalk cake or lower subsoil laid. And on the right here, you can see the subsoil in operation in the chalk cake. After the chalk cake and lower subsoil were laid and um, subsoiled, the upper subsoil was laid on top, and this was then chisel ploughed and cultivated with a power harrow, as you can see on the right here, and then seeded. Now, these were seeded in June or, or late June this year. And as you may well remember, there was a very hot and dry period in July and August and into September. This obviously is not ideal conditions for a uh, calcareous rotten establishment. And during the trials themselves, we saw very, um, very little in terms of emergence. As a result, we didn't conduct any uh, vegetation monitoring during the trials, the three month trial period. This photo was taken a couple of weeks ago, though, and you can now see that the grassland, um, including both grass, the grass itself and the associated forbs, is really establishing quite well. You can also see some arable weeds, which were no doubt present in the seed bank. We don't observe at this stage any clear differences between the soil profiles or the cultivation subsoil and treatments. This is something that we're very keen to continue looking at over the next couple of years. So in terms of the results we did measure, we found no substantial differences between subsoil and cultivation treatments in terms of soil physical, hydrological or chemical properties over the three month trial period. We did observe small declines in organic carbon over the course of the trial. This is probably for the same reason due to servants as mentioned in the uh, pilot trials, but to a lesser extent, this would be because the soil was drier and without some um, plant root activity to stimulate um, microbial activity, or at least that seems to be the, the, the most likely answer, but it's something to continue monitoring over longer term in the field trials. One thing that we monitored or that we found was a major decrease in infiltration rates following cultivation, which is not what we would have expected. We wonder if this is the effect of soil sealing or the development of a hydrophobic upper layer during drought. Overall, though, this seems to be a robust system with particular cultivation options not necessarily being critical to successfully achieving the soil properties or initial grasslands establishment that we're after. Um, we're keen to undertake longer term observations of this, 
And there's also going to be, as Chris mentioned, longer term field life temperature monitoring to shed further light on soil hydrology and what might be leaching out of the upper, sorry, the lower subsoil and chalkate layers. So the next phase in the field, the, the main trial phase in the field, are the field trials. These are larger scale, both um, in terms of having quite large plots and um, longer term, running over two years, and are going to be testing the four key probes I've looked at at the start. We'll have coarsely monitoring during these trials to have a longer term look at the drought and establishment. And to do that, we're going to be looking at what we looked at in the field trials and pilot trials. In addition, though, we're going to be adding in drone surveys to monitor and observe the establishment growth and species diversity of the grasslands. So finally, I'd like to thank our commercial partners, Align working with HS2, Jacobs and Tim O'Hare Associates, and at Cranfield, Professors Jane Rickson, Wilfred Otten, Rebecca Butler, Kerry Dawson, Chris Nelputinica, Lucy Mascona and Christina Van Midden for their help. And finally, thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Chris. Another excellent presentation um, and really brings those two together. Um, so moving on to questions now, I'm pleased to welcome Katie Faulkner, who's one of our early career committee members, who's been monitoring the questions um, that you've been sending in for our panelists. So just to remind you, if you can get any more questions to come in, get them coming in um, until about 10 to, uh, 10 to 1, uh, and hopefully then we'll have a chance to get through everything. So um, over to you, Katie. Thank you, Bruce, and thank you again to both of the speakers for those really interesting presentations. We've had some questions come through already, um, but as Bruce said, please keep these, these coming, please keep uh, submitting these. Um, so the first question that we've got is from um, Anna, and she has asked, because of the impeded percolation properties of the chalk cake, our surface and subsurface, subsur su surface and subsurface drainage systems combined with natural flood management strategies like artificial levees needed. So, Chris C, do you want to um, ask that, respond to that one first? Yeah. So, in terms of the the drainage, I mean, the, there's already a drainage plan um, in place, a permanent drainage plan, which doesn't include the need for any additional interventions. So, in the long term, um, drainage will all flow from the landscaping quadrants out to an existing culvert uh, adjacent to um, the highway, which runs along the eastern perimeter of the site. And, and that that the drainage regime it will control well it won't control conditions. We expect the conditions to be similar to pre-construction in terms of that drainage outflow, and that's a key assumption and something that's been um, tested through the calculations. So, in terms of the actual drainage, then we don't anticipate any need for anything further. Um, the focus on drainage within our trials and uh, within the landscaping is more about ensuring that we've got suitable soil moisture conditions. So. That's about looking at the, particularly the upper subsoil um, and the soil moisture level within that. So that's why we're looking at the likes of um, this aggregate layer, which should hopefully improve lateral subsurface flow, together with um, the potential for drainage trenches, um, which are, again are not needed from a drainage perspective, but needed, may be needed from a soil perspective um, for the calcareous grassland. And they would only serve to increase the um, rate of flow out of the upper subsoil um, through to the, the site drainage system. Brilliant, thank um, you. Um, sorry, Chris Chris M, do you want to add anything to that too? So I was just going to add that we had at Frankfurt a really interesting master's project last summer. And our student there, he looked at these profiles with the different layers, chalk cake layers, um, or aggregate drainage layers, or subsoil layers underneath the upper subsoil. And we did find that the um, the presence of the aggregate layer really did improve drainage and substantially, massively, in fact, uh, reduced surface runoff and surface erosion. So um, obviously, I think longer term erosion is not likely to be a huge problem once the grassland establishes. So that's not really a concern that's been looked at as a great deal. As Chris said, this isn't anticipated to be a problem. But um, that aggregate layer does seem to have a, a really important effect in, in allowing lateral drainage and uh, preventing surface runoff. Fantastic, thank you. And we've got a second question from Claudia, who is also interested in infiltration. So she asks, was there some thinking about mixing the subsoil with the aggregates to improve the infiltration rate? 
So should we go to Chris M first for that question? Um, I don't think that this is something which has been considered in the um, in the design, so I think it, it re isn't really necessary. The the um, subsoils, at least the vast majority of them that we've worked with at Cranfield, um, both the upper and lower subsoil are very well drained and they're quite stony soils. Um, they, they do retain some moisture, they do have a fairly high, um, high clay content, but they are nonetheless quite free draining due to their stoniness. Yeah, that's what I was adding. I agree Brilliant. with that. Agree with that, Chris. Um, inherently, the, the soils at the site pre-construction were uh, quite freely draining as it was pre-construction. Um, but the issue is with that, uh, you know, the chalk cake particularly being at a shallow depth um, post-construction. So that's why we're concerned with the, the drainage. But I don't, as I say, as Chris said, I don't think uh, it's necessary to mix with the aggregate. It would be uh, more, more appropriate to have an aggregate layer beneath the subsoil from our perspective. Fantastic, thank you. And um, we've got another question from Anna who's interested about the chalk cake and she asks, uh, does the chalk cake require maintenance due to losing some of its properties through leaching? Should we go to Chris C first for that one? Yeah, so in terms of um, maintenance, the in the long term there'll be, um, of course, vegetation um, maintenance, perhaps as part of the landscaping scheme, but there's no, there's no plan for chalk cake maintenance during in terms of the leachate so during construction um all the the drainage is controlled um and there are water treatment plant facilities on site to to treat the the water that's running off from the chalk cake um so all of that's managed via site uh water treatment plant um and also we're we're monitoring um groundwater of course um and looking at other monitoring measure, measurements to look at the um, leaching of the soils, for instance, lysimeters, which were mentioned. Um, so there's no anticipated need in the long term for, for certainly for any maintenance of the system. It's anticipated that post-construction, um, the leaching will have been reduced to uh, acceptable levels. And that's part of the, the the ground to risk assessment I mentioned that we completed, um, which is a contaminant vein transport modeling. So that that's all been assessed as not posing to risk in the long term. Great, thank you. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Chris? Um, uh, no, I, I completely agree. I think you've covered that all completely. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and there's quite a few more questions actually about the, the chalk cake. That seems to be an area of interest today. Um, so Paul asks, it sounds like the slowly permeable nature of the chalk cake may be a challenge. Are there any other chalky materials available Coombe One Association soils don't generally need drainage. So, um, Chris M, do you want to answer that one first? Um, so, I don't think it, it, I, I don't think either available chalk cakes or, or chalk materials would be all that relevant here, given that the purpose is really, to a large extent, to reuse this material being drilled out of the Chiltern tunnels and to find a useful purpose for that. Um, I, I, think, I, I don't think it's necessarily an unsuitable material at all. I think it, we just need to have the right configuration of profile layers um, and uh, drainage layer, drainage trenches, and that's what we're going to be investigating um, in the field trials. I didn't mention, but in the field trials, we're also going to be looking at the importance of the drainage trenches in much more detail, looking at areas with and without them um, present. So that should give us a, a um, better idea of how important they are and how how to use them to achieve the drainage properties we need. And yes, we, we wouldn't normally expect these soils to require additional drainage. This is purely that shortcake layer beneath them, which would be facing that situation. Just to add to that, I think that's all that makes sense, Chris. Um, in terms of the Coombe One soils not generally needing drainage naturally, I agree with that, um, as that's kind of evidenced by the, the pre-construction conditions. Of course, part of the, the reason for aiming for a calcareous grassland over the soils is over the chalk cake is the fact that we don't need to have a deep soil profile. So in a sense, that does um, minimise the site haulage to an extent because obviously there's a, a huge amount of soil to strip, store and then replace back over the, the, the material once, uh, you know, construction is complete and, and there's not necessarily the room to, to strip and store, you know, a metre's worth of soil and put that back on top. So that, that is one rationale for, for having that, that shallow soil depth. Um, and the chalk cake is is very different to the natural um, chalk soil that would naturally be present there. Um, 
<clears throat> there, in terms of what, what's available chalk wise, um, there are other chalk materials available at shallow depth that are being excavated during construction, but these generally uh, need to be used for <clears throat> engineering fill. So around the railway trace on the embankments, because it's quite important for geotechnical properties to, to use prioritizing material for, for that use. So there isn't really any um, leftover for our purpose to, to use in the landscaping at, at a more shallow depth. Brilliant, thank you. And Claudia's asked another question. Uh, species development on such sites will change over many years to come. That is natural. Um, so I wouldn't read into first year results. Um, have you got anything just to comment on that at all? Chris, you want to pick up first? Yeah. Um, okay, sure. Uh, so I think that's absolutely right. Um, so other studies which have looked at cloud health bath concentration have no, have seen that the the colonisation, particularly by the rarer um, calcials, the cloud health bath and specialists like rare orchid species, that can take five, ten, or more years, um, and the, the soil profiles will. Uh, de de develop themselves and the community will develop over the course of some decades and this will require ongoing management to ensure it is retained as calcareous grassland and succession doesn't um, continue to allow it to turn to scrubland but yes we, we absolutely expect the initial species diversity not to reflect the longer term um, aims or trajectory of it. I mean this is in an area with other relatively nearby calcareous grasslands. So we would expect and hope that species will colonise it over the coming years and decades to create the actual final vegetation. Yeah, I agree with all that, Chris, and say, um, as you say, not necessarily expecting the, the, the short term to reflect the long term. And, and we've got a, um, a longer term maintenance and monitoring regime in place to, to look at that. Brilliant. Thank you both. Um, We've got another question from uh, David who has asked, using a soil survey of this land, I found peat developed in the valley bottom. Any likely adverse impacts from construction and landscaping conservation work? Um, Chrissy, do you want to answer that one first? Yeah, sure. Um, we didn't find any peat on the site that we're speaking about, the Conn Valley and Slopes. However, in the, the valley bottom, so in the Colm Valley, um there were peat resources locally so um they're not being considered in today's presentation because the Colm valley um viaduct is a separate area for the purposes as of landscaping although there will be some um interchange of soils um we've obviously had to consider the the soils those peat soils carefully during construction um and manage them manage them separately um and the landscape proposal is still being developed for the Colm valley so that is being considered for um yeah the nature of those soils being considered for landscaping in, in that area anything to add to that chris um, um at no, all um, I, I don't have anything to add to that that all sounds sounds right perfect thank you um and we've got a further comment from claudia who has said very often organic matter content seems to be regarded as critical I would argue that organic matter levels are not as critical as long a uh, minimum of nutrients are provided. Once the plants are established, root exudate inputs will most likely increase the organic matter over time. Have you got any thoughts on that at all? Um, Chris M, should we go to you first this time? Um, I, I just say I entirely agree with that. Uh, <laughs> an initial amount of soil organic matter is obviously required to provide those nutrients to, to get the grassland kickstart as none underway. Um, in the longer term, we expect it to build up our soil carbon, as I mentioned, and um, additional nitrogen should build up in the system as well, given the species we have present. Yeah, Anything you'd like to add at all? I agree, I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, um, organic matter has looked at obviously as impacts on other soil properties, um, but it's not something we're we're super concerned with for the, for the calcareous grassland. Um, so yeah, agree with what Chris said. Great, thank you. Um, and we've got a further question on the chalk cake uh, from Alex. He asks, uh, were uses for the chalk cake considered offsite for different types of uses? If so, what were these? Should we go to Chrissy first for that one? Yeah, so I mean, in short, I, I don't I don't know of any offsite uses that are considered 
primarily because you know that's always been a fundamental tenant of the of the design is that we need to keep the material on site um it's two and a half you know two and a half million meters cubed of of chalk cake that's being excavated um and re retaining that on site is advantageous for a number of reasons um you, you know firstly um to keep it within a similar environment a similar receiving environment to that which it came from um obviously minimizing off-site haulage um you know the carbon and and cost impacts of, of keeping on site are huge so um, i'm not aware of any off-site uses being considered i know when we picked up the picked up this project it was um post it you know environmental statements so uh the hybrid planning um hybrid bill had gone through um, and we picked up a, a scheme design and developed it from there but that that was always an assumption that the shortcake would be retained on site And um, I, I don't know anything. I, I don't know anything further <laughs> to what Chris has said, and uh, I, I agree with all of that. Fantastic. Well, I think we've worked our way through all of the questions there. So um, I just want to thank you both again for the really interesting presentations and the really interesting Q and A session that we've had today. Um, and I'm going to hand back over to Bruce now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bruce, sorry, you're muted. Apologies, there you go. Sorry. Uh, so, yeah, so thanks, Katie. Um, we've come to the end of our webinar. Uh, on behalf of the uh, British Society of Soil Science, I'd like to thank um, both Chris Cantill uh, and Chris McCoskey for coming along to present today. Two uh, fantastic and, and very, clearly very well joined uh, presentations. Lots and lots of information in there for everyone to take away. Um, and thanks also to yourself, Katie, for coordinating and running the, the Q&A session. Um, so yeah, it just leaves me to say thank you all for attending. For those of you who'd, who'd like to, please do stay on um, for our very short Extraordinary General meeting, which will take place in a moment. Um, but if you are leaving us now, uh, you'll find a quick uh, feedback survey when you leave the webinar, which you hope we hope you'll find time to complete. It's really useful for us to hear your feedback um, so that we can, we can build on that and, and, and improve where needed um, in subsequent uh, webinars as well. Uh, and I guess just finally, the recording of the video will be available uh, after the event on our YouTube channel. Uh, so, yeah, thank you all very much. <laughs>